Happy Black History Month, Raph. Thank you so much for being here. Welcome back to our absolute favorite, Dr. Gianni Clarkson. He's gonna be joined today by our esteemed John Wells, but we're gonna kick off the program with our queen, Carla Patton. Congratulations, queen, 25 years. Y'all cannot wait for this conversation. I am going to be quiet and let the show get started. So thank you, welcome, can't wait for this. Hi, everybody. Thanks for joining us for today's session. I'm super excited for more than one reason. One, Gianni is here. Um, so always excited for that. And you may be thinking like, is it Halloween? Why are you dressed up? No, it's not Halloween. But this past Sunday, I was recognized as an honoree in my sorority, Alpha Kappa Alpha Sorority Incorporated, in which Gianni will talk about the history of our sorority. But um, I was recognized for having 25 years of service in the sorority, and we were adorned with crowns and medallion, and we make it to silver star status in AKA land. So I'm super proud. I'm going to be celebrating all year long. So you may see this again, even without Gianni. So I'm sorry in advance. I'm excited. So um, thank you all for joining. And Gianni, you can take it from here. I'm super excited to hear what you have to say about our wonderful Divine Nine. Thank you so much. And once again, congratulations, Carla. And I should also congratulate my aunt as well, who's also joining us. Hey, 25 years. So that'll be really great. John, this plans to be a good time. I'm going to check and make sure that I can share my screen. And once I know that I can share my screen, we will be on our way. So I'm going to get a thumbs up from you, John, and a thumbs up from you, Carla. Are we good? We are good to yes. go. Let it rip. Awesome. Let's go ahead and let it rip. I'm going to move this icon out of the way because I love to be able to see the full screen. And we'll start something like this, John. Uh, to, of course, the Ice Cold Brothers where there is, well, no other. To the pretty girls that wear 20 pearls like Kamala and Carla. Hey, gorgeous, we see you. To the sons of blood and thunder. To the devastating div divas. Hey, Tanisha, we see you as well, too. To, of course, the pretty boys, the poodles. To, of course, the gentlemen of I Iota Phi Theta. And those that are constitutionally bound to the Sigmas and to the Zetas. I say welcome. And if you don't understand anything that I just said, don't worry, you will in a sec. Well, let me clean this up. You'll understand enough for you to know. And if you want access, well, get online. John, let's get after it. How's everything with you? Everything's great. This is a fantastic topic. Uh, as we talked earlier, I know a little bit about it because where I went to school, uh, the Omega Sci-Fi's were on campus. So we have a yeah. little bit of familiarity, but not to the depth and knowledge that you do. So I'm, I'm interested in, in learning more and, and having a great chat. So excited. Hey, let's get after it. Let's get after it. So today we're going to talk about the Divine Nine. And the Divine Nine, of course, are all the organizations that I just recently shouted out, which, of course, is Alpha Phi Alpha Attorney Incorporated, Alpha Kappa Alpha Sorority Incorporated, Kappa Alpha Psi uh, Fraternity Incorporated, Omega Psi Phi Fraternity Incorporated, Delta Sigma Theta Sorority Incorporated, Phi Beta Sigma Fraternity Incorporated, Zeta Phi Beta Sorority Incorporated, Sigma Gamma Rho Sorority Incorporated, and Iota Phi Theta Fraternity Incorporated. I know it sounds like a mouthful, but don't worry. We'll clean this all up and it'll make sense. These are nine of the most important organizations of all of Black history. And it's very hard to find any pinpoint inside of American history where you don't run into any of these nine stop signs that have been the change makers and those that have moved policy and principle around to help make sure that everyone gets a seat at the table. And sometimes being bold enough to make tables of our own because we realize, hey, we need to do that as well, too. So what I'm going to do in the time that I have is that I'm going to stop and highlight one member from each of these organizations that have helped contribute to the arts, either in performing or visual. Now, mind you, I could do this lecture and it would probably last for days of all the great things that all these various members have did in different organizations. But what I wanna do is just give you a tidbit or just a piece so that what it does is it encourages your own individual research, right? Now, in Vanity, I could literally always start with the originators, which of course would be Alpha Phi Alpha Fraternity Incorporated, but that's not fair. Instead, what I'm going to do is I'm going to start with the youngest uh, fraternity that was founded in 1963. But along the way, before we get started, I think the most important thing, John, I have to do 
is I have to level set. And what I mean by that is that I need to tell you who we are versus who we are not. We are fraternal and sorority organizations. We are not a cult and we are not a clan. We are developed and designed to make sure that people are, of course, always protected and make sure that we further, of course, missions of mankind, whether it be the fact of in community service, whether it be in scholarship or mentorship, that's what we're here to do. We are not any part of things that you make you denounce various things or def definitely denounce various methods or, or origins or family members, which of course seems to sometimes be a popular rumor. We are willing to talk about our organization, but we're not gonna tell you everything about the organization because of course, John, you being in a fraternity know this, hey, membership has its privileges. And if you're not a member, there are privileges that you just don't have. Let's just say this, Divine Nine organizations are the superheroes. We make sure that everything that is going great inside of various communities, whether they be those that are downtrodden, those that are on the up mobile climb, or those that are in a great place, we are the superheroes. You can't know all our secret identities, but you know us by our colors and our hand signals. And I hope that I've explained that without being a little bit too cheeky along the way. Fair enough, John? Oh, yeah, all good. All right. <laughs> So let's start here. Sometimes when we talk about fraternities and sororities, we only think about one aspect of it. And that aspect is always stepping. Now, don't get me wrong. Stepping is fun, but uh, we're a little bigger than that. Well, that was me. Uh, that's still me. I can still do that. So, John, are you ready? Because we practice this part. You ready? I'm, let's, I would, yeah, let's do it. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Then for those people that ask, that is, that is me. And I hope that you're able to hear the sound of that. Um, at one time in my life, I actually did work at an organization that uh, was really kind of the trendsetters inside of using stepping as a tool, as a performing arts. Form, but also being able to reach out to students. And this organization, of course, still exists some 20 plus some years later, which is absolutely great. But I've always enjoyed stepping, always found a way to connect the students and always kind of get them a way to be a segue into talking about divine out organizations. And of course, talking about the importance of going to college. So we'll start with, of course, 1963. But before that, before that, before that, John, you're really smart. Let's do this. You remember this TV show? Okay, there is a TV show, right, that was breaking all these records and it was based in New York. Remember? Let's sing the theme, John. Then you know, you know the theme. Oh yeah, it was it was yes, it was it was Friends and the theme song was sung by the Rembrandts or something like that. Yeah, see John, Listen. I don't sing that one. I sing right. We Are Living Single uh, yep. in a nice kind of world because if we know anything about living single, living single, well, friends is white living single. But how did white living single kind of um, happen, right? It happened because of a man by the name, of course, those that know the show Living Single, of course, know Kyle Barker. But we also know him by a man by the name of T.C. Carson. T.C. Carson is a member of Iota Phi Theta. Iota Phi Theta was founded at Morgan State University in 1963. Now, the reason why I want to highlight uh, T.C. Carson was because he played a character by the name of Kyle Barker. Now, in the 90s, the fact that there was a Black man that had this wonderful wealth of vocabulary, he was really, really well-dressed, and of all things, he was a stockbroker in New York. This is the first time we've had a character like this. So it was absolutely insane. When this show was in its prime, Living Single, it got the attention of Martha Kaufman and, of course, David Kranzberg, who said, if there's any show on TV that I would want right now, that show 
would be living single. Well, you change some pieces around and now you have what friends. But T.C. Carson was a major voice into making sure that living single definitely went out of his way to highlight a working class black folks that really were all absolutely intriguing. From Kyle Barker's character, who was a stockbroker, Erica Alexander's character, who was a lawyer, Kim Fields, who was basically this rich debutante, but also worked at a bank as well. Of course, we had Queen Latifah's character, who uh, owned a magazine, which was called Flavor. She took her friend along with her, who, of course, was taking her friend along with her. Uh, her friend worked with her, with her as her assistant. And, of course, we have, of course, on the end, uh, her boyfriend. And a lot of people do give him a bad rap because they want to pretend like he was just the guy that cleaned up the building. Nope. Absolutely wrong. He actually owned part of the building. That's right. He owned part of the building. This is where we talk about the importance of openly mobile people. So Kyle Barker worked as the Kyle, Kyle Barker or T.C. Carson helped to develop these scripts to make sure that black folks were highlighted in a different way. So shout out to T.C. Carson, a member of Iota Phi Theta, of course, 1963, founded Morgan State University, which is an HBCU located in Baltimore, Maryland. All right. Sounds good. We're on a good trip. Oh, All yeah. Right, let's get I remember. And, yep. All right. Let's get good to show. it. Good show. And, and the winner is. So now we're looking at African-American Oscar winners, right? We have Octavia Spencer. Octavia Spencer won for The Help. We'll put a pin right there for Octavia Spencer. We have Sidney Poitier. Of course, Sidney Poitier won for Lilies in the Field. We have, of course, uh, Jamie Foxx, who won for Ray. We have Forrest Whitaker, who won for the King of Scotland. And of course, the night that Denzel Washington said something that etched in my mind forever. We're going to kill two birds with one stone, I see this evening, where Denzel Washington won for Training Day and Halle Berry won for Monsters Ball. However, let's go ahead and go here. Octavia Spencer plays uh, a woman in the movie called The Help about what it means to be a domestic for a, a white family. Um, and yet, inside of all the great things that Octavia Spencer does, we still have to deal with this fact that she, once again, wins an Academy Award for playing a domestic. But the first African-American to ever win an Oscar is a woman simply by the name of Hattie McDaniel. And Hattie McDaniel's star power is really ignored. She's a member of Sigma Gamma Rho. Sigma Gamma Rho was founded, of course, 1922 at Butler University, which of course is located in the state of Indiana. Now, Hattie McDaniel is a star twice over. What do I mean by that? There are 121 African-Americans who have stars on the Hollywood Walk of Fame. Only 33 of them have multiple stars, okay? She is one one of one who has multiple stars on the Hollywood Walk of Fame. She has a star on the Hollywood Walk of Fame, of course, for being in film. And she has another star on the Hollywood Walk of Fame for radio. She holds the record of being the first woman ever to have her voice on the radio. That's right. First woman to be on a microphone and have her voice broadcasted through the air. And that's why she's there. Her Oscar, which was given to her for going on with the wind, she had written this beautiful speech, but however, the studio at this time was very afraid that she would mention things about race, racism in America, and they wrote her speech for her. That's right. If you ever go back and read that speech, you'll notice how mechanic that speech is. But after the end of it, she walks off, she cries, and you can see that she's deeply moved. Hattie McDaniel, though she always unfortunately played roles of domestics, was a brilliant Shakespearean actor that we completely ignore, and she never really gets that credit. However, she's a trendsetter. Someone had to be bold enough to step out there and, of course, be the first to be on radio, be the first to uh, blatantly go out of the way to sing gospel music in parts of the world that weren't comfortable with a Black woman's voice being on radio. But yet she fights through all types of stereotypes, all types of racism, and for that, this woman of Sigma Gamma Rho, we acknowledge her. And Hattie McDaniel, we thank you. Her Oscar, unfortunately, is not, we're not able to find her Oscar. Her Oscar has been said to be um, stolen from uh, Howard University, unfortunately, during the riots of Dr. King and has never been replaced. Hopefully the Academy takes the time to bring that Oscar home 
to the people at Howard University because it's important, it's Black history, and so is Hattie McDaniel. All right, let's go ahead and get to it. I'm going to show you a number, John, 16%. It's a weird number. It's a very low number. It's an uncomfortable number. Welcome to the 1930s, right? Inside the 1930s in Southern Peninsula, Florida, there is, of course, a really beautiful town there that's, of course, known as like Eastville. And Eastville has this really beautiful slogan that says that its soil is its riches. Its riches is its earth. Uh, many African-Americans post-1930s are still making money in a sharecropping fashion. They are making money by working land that doesn't belong to them and then selling crops to someone else. And that's how that money is being made. Because of this barely able to survive status, in the 1930s, only six, actually between the, let me do this correctly, between the period of 1930 to 1934, only 16% of African-Americans in the entire country are literate. 1930 to 1933 are literate. So what breaks this literacy gap and helps change it to almost 72% just in a jump of two years? Let me introduce you to Zora Neale Hurston. Zora Neale Hurston is a member of Zeta Phi Beta Sorority Incorporated. Of course, it was founded on the campus of Howard University uh, right here in the nation's capital in 1920. The jump in literacy comes to a book that she wrote called Their Eyes Were Watching God. This book is highly controversial. It's highly controversial for the fact that this is a book that features an African-American woman. And it talks about a lot of uncomfortable things at this time in 1930s. It talks about racism. It talks about sexual assault on black women. It talks about the levels of literacy. It talks about a patriarchy that unfortunately exists and how this black woman, though she's trying to find her identity, is trying to fight all these just roadblocks one after one after one. And this book is beautifully written and found, of course, written in 1937. Now, this book inspires a culture of African-Americans to want to be able to read. No one wants to hear this story told to them, John. They want to, he they want mm -hmm. to read this story for themselves. And it's been directly said that this book, Their Eyes Are Watching God, is directly connected to the literacy rate of African-Americans, just not in the South, but also in the North as well, too. Now, it's very interesting that Zeta Phi Beta Sorority Incorporated is found at Howard University. And if you look to the right of the screen, I have a copy of the newspaper called The Hilltop. If you ever are fortunate enough to come to the nation's capital and visit Howard University's campus, you notice that you have to walk up a hill to officially get on campus from George Avenue. That's where Zora Neale Hurston, of course, gets the idea of The Hilltop uh, being the name of the paper. And she's the founder of this student paper. The Hilltop still exists today. And believe it or not, it is still in the debate, depending on how you want to debate this. The Hilltop is either the fifth or sixth oldest African-American publication that is still publicized today. And, I, and you, it's someone, I just peeked in the chat that someone mentioned that, yes, Zora Neale Hurston does favor Queen Latifah a lot as well, too. So you're thinking about this, that there's this newspaper that's been in existence for a hundred some years started by a black woman and still exists today. And for that, Zora Neale Hurston, we celebrate you and thank you. All right? John, I, you got that. Yeah, you did, did, that I, I, got, I, I, just, I, I just have a, I, I, maybe not so a quick question because I'm, I'm tying the 16%, you know, in the thirties literacy rate to this, you know, the 70 some odd percent right. and this book is the catalyst. What I'm, what I'm wondering is this book must have done more than, than, inspire people to learn to read because i would imagine the desire was always there but something systemically must have changed that that either there was that, that african americans weren't allowed in schools the school like how how do you go from right 16 percent to somebody on percent right. systemically i guess is my question so it, it's a it's a book that where representation once again matters right like john right. you know you know, being in, being in marketing, we understand that people need to see themselves and hear themselves. 
And this is a book that is unlike any other. This is, of course, during the time of the Harlem Renaissance, where so much great literature is coming out. And no one wants to be left out. Though it's the 1930s, FOMO has existed forever, the fear of missing yeah. out. Now we have something that's inspired people to want to be a part of this. And, and that's why this book is so important. Now, sadly, <laughs> and once again, I say sadly, because of the controversy that's connected inside this book, where there are conversations about sexual assault on African-American women, the language goes a little blue sometimes because, hey, we're, we're going to talk about what, what it is, what it is. And some words are not necessarily the strongest educational views. It's been banned in many different mm -hmm. districts and states, which is a horrible move because this is something that happened. And this representation is so important. So I, 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 to this day, I remember reading this book and being so taken back and I could not stop reading it. So that's why I labeled her a bullhorn for equality because in a world where many stories were male led, here's a story yeah. from a black woman that's led by a book that where the main character, the protagonist is a black woman and the antagonist is all the things that black women have to deal with in their experience at that time. And I'll, I'll go a little bit more uncomfortable. And sadly, many of the things that Zora Neale Hurston talks about in their eyes were watching God are many of, and, I'm, and please forgive me, this is not me mansplaining, I'm just here to report the news. But there's a lot of these things black women deal with in 2024. Mm -hmm. So why not read it? Because we, yeah. we we clearly haven't learned the lesson, right? So to Zora Neale Hurston, we thank you, and we'll go ahead and move on, right? What song makes you feel pride? pride? What song makes you feel pride, John? That's a, it's an interesting conversation, right? <laughs> yeah, you know it it, it 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 really is. I mean, you can go to the the cliches and stuff like that but there's there there's an interesting song for me um it's play pray for jungle land by travis meadows and jungle land is a song by okay. bruce springsteen but the, the 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 song about the song is the song that <laughs> makes me uh feel pride so i'm i'm gonna go my alma mater you know the singing yep. dealers alma mater of course yeah um I, i'm gonna go with of course my fraternity hymn um Pride, and I, it's gonna be it's gonna be a little weird, but uh, "Purple Rain" by Prince. <laughs> I don't know sure, why. Sure, it, I just I love that song. Um, but there's there's something about the word pride. Pride makes you swell up. It makes you feel a certain yeah. type of way. I see someone putting in chat formation. I like that as well too. But think about a time inside the African American lore where there's there's always this fighting grass for pride. How do I say out loud that I am this thing? I think about songs of pride, I think about James Brown, say it loud, yeah. I'm black and I'm proud. But before then, let's go to, of course, the man, the song of a nation, James Weldon Johnson, uh, who's a member of Phi Beta Sigma, founded in 1914 at Howard University. Now, James Weldon Johnson wrote the song of all songs, and it's a song called Lift Every, Lift Every Voice and Sing. Uh, this song originally was a poem, but because it was so great and so moving of a poem, it was set to music. And of course, everyone knows this song. Um, if you don't, if you hear the opening chords, you know exactly what time it is. So it, it's it's beautiful, beautiful song. Um, Lift every voice and sing till earth and heaven ring. Ring with the harmony of liberty. Like you cannot just not, that opening lyric, woo! I mean, it just does something for you, right? And it's yeah. it, to me, yeah. that is a, a swelling and a call to action, right? So I put up top, uh, protest, uh, San Francisco, 1971. And this song was sung at a swelling pace. And when we talk about uh, finding justice for, of course, Black Panthers. And I mean, this is like an, an insane uh, song. In fact, um, during this 
protest that lasted for roughly 79 hours. They sung this song over and over and over again. And this song swells with such a pride. So it's very interesting to think that here's a song that's written roughly 1920s is now a song that's sung 50 plus some years later and still is part of African-American lexicon in no matter where we go. So all that to say is that James Weldon Johnson's Lift Every Voice and Sing is the pride of a nation. And, mm -hmm. you know, though people try to commercialize this song, it is still a song that means a lot and it swells us all up with pride when we hear those opening lyrics. In fact, um, I tease because I have a really great friend that knows all the verses to the song and we will sing this. So this is a song that means a lot. And, I'm, and James Weldon Johnson, we salute you for this wonderful song and we appreciate that. Poems. What's the first poem that you remember reading? First poem that I ever remember reading was a Shel Silverstein poem. I am sure. Yeah, right. Um, and I had to memorize the only one that comes to mind is I had to memorize it uh, for class and probably I don't know elementary school. It was called "Ickle Me Pickle Me Tickle Me Too." Went for a ride in flying shoe. Hooray with fun! It's time we flew. Cried "Ickle Me Pickle Me Tickle Me Too." Over the sun and beyond the blue, and I can keep going. But uh, that's right. the first song I remember reading. Poem I remember reading. I, 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 I remember, of course, poems by, you know, Langston Hughes and, of course, you know, little nursery rhymes you learn as a kid. But I, I think about the fact of being so phenomenal of a writer that there are li literally some poems that we will never see with our own eye. And I want to highlight uh, this next artist, which, of course, would be Dr. Nikki Giovanni. Now, Dr. Nikki Giovanni, of course, is a member of Delta Sigma Theta Sorority Incorporated. Now, Delta Sigma Theta was founded uh, at Howard University here in Washington, D.C. You're talking about someone that's just not a poet, but a civil rights activist. And at one time, I had the title, of course, of Poet, po poet Lord uh, inside the United States. To, be, to have that title means that everything that you write is gold standard. And just not the fact that you write it in its gold standard, but your performance is gold standard. Here we talk about the fact of Dr. Giovanni's uh, poems being used as conversation pieces, all these wonderful things that, of course, um, help to motivate the civil rights movement, help to empower uh, children's movements inside of making sure that equality happens. This is one of the lines that I took from a poem here. And it says that sometimes I see things that aren't really there, like warmth and kindness when people are mean. But sometimes I see things like fear and want to soothe it or fatigue and want to share it or love and want to receive it. It's a beautiful poem by, um, by Nikki Giovanni. So, and like I said, I could have littered this page with all the brilliant work of Dr. Giovanni and all the, of course, the million contributions that she's given to literary classes across the world. But this has to be said as well, too. Sometimes in entertainment, we can tell some hard truth that we can't say in political arenas, right? It's a little, yeah. it, it doesn't hurt us as much. And what I love about Nikki Giovanni and the work that she's able to accomplish is that she's able to take a mirror and hold it up at American and say, see, this is, these are our problems and, and we can get better. And most importantly, I'm rooting for you. Um, she's not just a weatherman or a weather woman. She's a person that tells you what's wrong with the weather and how can we put things together and make things better. She provides an umbrella, she provides comfort and her words are amazingly soothing. And for that, uh, Dr. Giovanni, we thank you for that and of course, the women of Delta Sigma Theta uh, Sorority Incorporated. I'm a little excited right now because I see one of my former students and she happens to be a member of Delta Sigma Theta. Hey, Elizabeth, I'm so proud of you. All right. What was the first song you remember hearing on the radio? On the radio? 
Yeah, and it's funny because the sailor radio now, like my kids don't, my students don't listen to the radio now. Yeah, um, I would have to say that would be Jim Croce. You don't mess around with Jim and a red Dotson with my mom in Honolulu, Hawaii in 1974. Wow. I like that. I like I can that. sing That's... that one too, word for word, but I'm yeah, not Yeah, I'm, I'm, <laughs> I'm thinking like, for mine, it's going to be Junior's Mama used to say, loose ends. Um, and I mean, I can sing loose end songs like I wrote them. And this is like, you know, 80s loose ends. Uh, you got me hanging by a string. I love, love that. No, I'm not singing. <laughs> I'm, not singing. I'm not singing that. Um, and also, I'm also of an era too. Um, and I'll, I'll be old for a second. It'll be, it'll be fun. I remember, of course, putting your tape, a blank tape, oh, yeah. in the in there and pressing that record button, right, to make sure that yep. you got your song, right? Now, mind you, if you're a certain area, you're like, I don't know what you're talking about. Listen, when you didn't have money or you were just trying to listen oh, yeah. to do this, if you wanted to make the ultimate mixtape for a girl that you like, oh, this was the move. Yep. This was yep. the move. Right? So the, the radio has always been a way for the artist to get their new product out to a listening public. Um, but what about a time where African-Americans unfortunately fought for radio time. Let me bring you to a man of Omega Psi Phi Fraternity Incorporated, the King of Swing, a man by the name of Count Basie. Count Basie is dealing with a very interesting uh, problem, along with Duke Ellington, who's also a member of Alpha Phi Alpha Fraternity Incorporated. Shameless plug there. But Count Basie is dealing with the fact that he has a product that everybody loves. The problem with this product that everyone loves is that everyone's taking it from him and no one is paying for it. Count Basie is really the father of not payola, but being able for artists to have their songs played on mm -hmm. the radio and get residuals back from that. He realized mm -hmm. that this was extremely unfair to African-American artists. And he went out of his way to fight radio stations about it tooth and nail. Anytime he went to a radio station, he had a team that went directly to that radio station and said, hey, you just played my song. I need my money. And this is very difficult to do, you know, because this is not a cell phone email error. He's doing this by hand. But what he did was that he level set to make sure that people were able to get paid for the music that was being played. Like, think about it. People are listening to your music, John. Yeah. And you're yeah. making all the money in the world off of this music that you did that you you're not making any music money off the music you created, but yet this radio station is. And Count Basie said, I'm not for it. And completely yep. level set what needs to happen. Count Basie is a not just a brilliant musician, but a brilliant businessman. So in the midst of us celebrating him as an artist, he also lets people know, I'm not gonna be a starving artist. You're gonna pay me for my work. Yeah. And for that, Count Basie, we thank you. Uh, unfortunately, Artists still today are paid pennies on top of pennies whenever their songs come out. But before there was Count Basie, there was really no money paid into them at all. And for that, we thank Count Basie. If he was around today, there'd probably be a different economics in the uh, right. Spotify streaming streaming payments. Right, I'm thinking today, about right? you know streaming. I'm thinking about yep. him having his own YouTube page. All yep. the things that happen, and then the world of NIL, name, image, and likeness. Who yep. knows what basically we've been able to get away with. Yeah. The other side of the tracks. Um, we don't, it's it's sometimes a very disparaging term, the other side of the tracks. When we think about the other side of the tracks, we think about uh people that are unsavory, people that we don't want to be associated with. We think about uh people that are, are very different from us. But what if there was a person that could hold a telescope up and say to us, you know what? We are. Um, a lot different. Um, we're not that different, the two, the two of us. And I'm sorry, I need to clean something up because I'm playing something in the back of my mind. Omega Sci-Fi is not 1913. Omega Sci-Fi is 1911. That is a horrible mistake on my end. It's 1911. I was going to say something, Gianni, but I, uh, Doc Carson, but I, 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 I just was going to let you get away. <laughs> no, with I was it. like, I was oh, call it out, but I'm just like, no, I was like, oh, it, no, I said, that's, that's absolutely horrible. <laughs> Delta Sigma Theta, 1913, of course, Omega Sci Fi, 1911. And we'll go right into his other one, his H as well, too, uh, 1911. So the other side of the tracks, 
we have to have someone that holds a lens up to us, right? Or holds, uh, show, puts us all in front of the telescope to see across the other side of the tracks and be able to say that, you know, we are not that different. There's community ties to us. Um, we are linked by a common goal of wanting to be successful, wanting to be happy, wanting our friends and family to be protected. And one of the greatest tellers of this is a man by the name of John Singleton. John Singleton is a member of Kappa Alpha Psi Fraternity Incorporated. Kappa Alpha Psi is founded inside of Indiana University. And there are two movies that uh, highlight his career uh, before he unfortunately passed away roughly about two years ago, right? Uh, of course, if you are on FX and you're watching Snowfall or have completed Snowfall, it's a great, um, a great, great, great series. Shout out to the wonderful, beautiful talent, Angela Lewis, who I went to school with at CAS. Uh, who was also in a show place, Aunt Louie. But here you have John Singleton, who has two movies that staple or bookmark his career perfectly to a certain extent. We have Boys in the Hood. But Boys in the Hood is a story that kind of, once again, shows light of what's happening inside of African-American communities along with, you know, gang violence and, and trying to find a way out of no way. Everyone knows the heartbreaking scene of Ricky who is the guy that is going to make it and how unfortunately he loses his life and it sets off a domino series of events. Uh, Rosewood is a story of just this African-American township that's trying to survive in the midst of this racist period of the early, late, well, early 1900s. And how can this group of African-Americans fight against this racism that is trying to basically take over this town and their resources? John Singleton is brilliant in this, casting young, casting unknown actors, partnering them with actors that are well known. And by doing this, he creates a brand that is, you know, been tried to be, tried to be copied a million times over. And for that, John Singleton, we thank you for that, because you're showing a new lens of America. And though you are not no longer on this side of heaven, John Singleton's blueprint of how to tell stories inside of African-American communities is, is really kind of like followed by many directors to this day. Let's go here. Representation matters. It, it's important, right? Representation is the reason why I, I went to an HBCU. Uh, representation is the reason why I believe the things that I could achieve. Representation is a, is a big deal. Seeing yourself means a lot. Um, John, on your end, you're seeing the fact of the casting of commercials being a lot different. The casting of, of print art and magazines is a lot different. People were one time looking very cookie cutter. Now people look different. Not different. People look more American. They look like what America looks like. For me, representation matters. And I'll say this because uh, I think about my HBCU experience. And one of the reasons why I went to an HBCU was because really this woman right here, and this woman is, I'd like to call her America's mom to a certain extent, who is Felicia Rashad. Felicia Rashad has an acting career that is absolutely bar none, right? Felicia Rashad, of course, is a member of Alpha Kappa Alpha Sorority Incorporated, founded 1908 uh, on the campus of Howard University, right? But Though you see her on screen, it's the behind the work, behind the, the camera work that I mm -hmm. want to talk about. A Different World was a show that was not, was like no other. Uh, if you were a kid, a Different World kid, you know you have your favorite episode. I mean, of course, I can give a couple of lines. Felicia, Felicia, let's go get a pizza. Don't fool me. There's, of course, the episode where we really didn't like Dean Kane. And if you know what episode I'm talking about, where we all kind of looked at DK, kind of sideways for a minute, which was a very powerful episode. We think about all the great things that were there. Felicia Rashad went out of her way to make sure when reviewing the scripts of this, of this show with her sister, Debbie Allen, to make sure that there was nothing but positive images that highlight the HBCU experience for, for kids. And I'm a product of that. She did everything possible along with the other team of really great writers to make sure that nothing was offensive. 
that there was always an upward mobile movement of feeling when you watch a different world. There are stories about how she would bring in test audiences of high school students, sit them down, watch the, let, let them watch the show, and then ask them at the end of it, how do you feel about this? I mean, many of my friends, <laughs> we all wanted to go to Hillman. And then our hearts <laughs> were broken when we found out Hillman wasn't even a real school. But that's the greatness of a different world. Um, and we we have a, we have her to thank for that. Um, I know at times we we tend to lean a lot of the brilliance of a different world on male writers, but no, that's not fair. A lot of this brilliance comes from Felicia Rashad and her willingness to test out audiences, see how does this land or how does it fit inside of it. So for that, Felicia Rashad, we thank you. I'm, I'm shameless plug. I'm happy to serve on the board of trustees at Ford's Theater with her, and she is absolutely pleasant and delightful. And um, hey, I, that's all I have to say about that. It's, it's That means a lot. All right. Let's go ahead and move on to this. All right, John, you're a music guy. Who stole the Super Bowl? All the great performances, who stole the Super Bowl? Was it Usher? Do we give it to Prince? Do we give it to Beyonce? What about Stevie Wonder? Who stole the Super Bowl? I know it's a loaded question. Marvin Gaye, I like that. Dr. Who's... Dre. Who stole the Super Bowl? When they performed at the Super Bowl, you were like, Woo! They did it. Michael Jackson, because he was the first one to do it because they were developing programming so people would turn away to watch this halftime show on a different channel. And the very next year, they decided to hire Michael Jackson and make the Super Bowl halftime an event. So I would say Michael Jackson. You stole my lead. And I love that, John, because the person who's responsible for really stealing the Super Bowl is a man of Alpha Phi Alpha Fraternity Incorporated. Let me introduce you to some uh, Kenan Ivory Wayans. Kenan Ivory Wayans is a member of Alpha Phi Alpha Fraternity Incorporated. And in 1991, he realized that the Super Bowl show yep. was absolutely awful. And for those that do not know, before you got all these brand names like Usher and Beyonce and Stevie Wonder, they would do like themes like uh holiday themes um music in space all these kind of weird themes that would come out however keen ivory wayans along with tommy davidson said you know what we can make a better show and they perfectly timed it along with cbs and stole 20 million viewers over to fox for 20 minutes yep. marketing people were absolutely furious because you pay big money for those ads, and little do you know, whoop, 20 million of them went that way. After that, and John is absolutely correct, the next year, the performer was Michael Jackson. They knew they had to do something. So Keen Ivy Wayne's, of course, steals the Super Bowl halftime show. But Keen Ivy Wayne's is bigger than this theft of a halftime show. And Living Color is a groundbreaking show that happened in the 90s. It rivals Saturday Night Live at this time. And though some of the material, like some comedy material, doesn't age well in 2024, what it did was it was a sketch comedy show that gave, you know, the start to many brilliant performers, i.e. David Allen Greer, Jamie Foxx, Tommy Davidson, and a little known actor at this time by the name of James Carey before he changed his name to Jim Carey. We can also throw in the fact of the likes of, of Jennifer Lopez, other Wayans that we got introduced to. So this kind of, without Key and Ivory Wayans, we really don't have the Chappelle show. We don't have Key and Pill. We do not have, um, I'll go say all that. We don't have a lot of the Black woman sketch comedy show, which is brilliant on HBO, by the way. We don't really have a lot of these great shows if it's not for Keen Ivy Wayne's and A Living Color. And I want to be able to give him his flowers, though he's overlooked as a Hollywood pioneer. But yes, he is a Hollywood pioneer. And he's a father to the modern day of what sketch comedy can look like. Now, this is not me overlooking like Flip Wilson 
and other greats, comedy greats as well, too, like Red Fox. But I want to be very fair here. In this modern era, Keen Ivory Wayne's laid out a really great blueprint of what it meant to write, how to be political, how to be relevant, and also how not to trade in your culture for money and laughs and everything else. So for that, I absolutely, absolutely love Keen Ivory Wayne's. So to the greatest attorney in the world, I'm not biased, who was founded at Cornell <laughs> University in 1906, <laughs> Keen Ivory Wayne's, we thank you. So, John, that is it. We have painted a canvas of African-American greatness. Uh, it's a canvas that, of course, could have went anywhere, right? We could have, you know, told the story of MC Light, who's a member of Sigma Gamma Rho, and how her being a, a woman in C, all the great things that she was able to do. We could talk forever about the work of Paul Robeson, who's of course is an alpha as well too. We could talk about Morris Chestnut, who's an alpha as well. We could talk about uh, all these really great people inside of these interesting, Aretha Franklin, who's a member of Delta Sigma Theta. Alicia Keys is a member of Alpha Kappa Alpha Sorority Incorporated, and the list goes on and on and on and on. So I say this, when you see those beautiful letters up there, those are stop signs. And there's nowhere where you stop in history that you can ignore the contributions of all these great people. And honestly, I'm very humbled to share this with you. Thank you so much for your kind heart and your listening ears. Well, awesome. It's always a pleasure. And uh, what I'm sensing is, is while all nine are divine, one of them may be a little bit more divine for you than, <laughs> than, than, right. than the other eight. I'm, I'm just picking up on that a little bit. Right, right. Um, but, but no, it, 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 go ahead, go ahead. No, I was going to say, th this is great. And what I mean, there's there's so much to, to, to chat about. And if anybody has any questions, please throw them in the chat. But what I think is is one thing that I find interesting is certainly the purpose-driven nature of the fraternities and sororities continues to translate to business success. But what I also think is interesting in, in, in most, if not all cases, it was purpose-driven and they weren't doing it for the credit, but yet the economics followed. You know what I mean? So if you right. think about it from a business perspective, you know, we have a purpose of standing up for individuality. And I, and I would just implore people, you know, figure out what's, what is right to be done and doing it for a purpose. And then it sounds cliche, but a lot of times then the economics come with that. If it, if, right. if that is an outcome that can, can be derived, not that everything has to do with economics, like the, the, the book that led to literacy, there was not an economic outcome from that. But it was still a, a, an impactful outcome. So just the purpose-driven nature of the organization into what these people did in real life is is very interesting and compelling. Yeah, it's it's a. It, I'll say this, and you know, of course, inside of the allure of Divine Nine, there's always a little friendly going back and forth with one another. Yeah. But at the end of the day, it's really about the upliftment of yeah. what's going on inside of our communities. And that to me is when it's at its best. And when it's yeah. at its best, it's absolutely perfect. And no one is ignoring the founding statement of why these organizations were founded. You know, all these organizations were founded in very unique times and have very unique reasons why yeah. they were founded. And whenever someone says, well, which one is better? Of course, there's a joke of, well, of course mine is, but that's how you're supposed to feel. Yeah. But the correct answer really is, is that, when we all work for the benefit of the community, we are all better. And that's what makes it great. That's really, really what yeah. makes it great. So um, I've been able to, of course, make friends uh, in all other various organizations. And um, we, of course, talk about history and proud of the, the work that our members are doing currently and those that have happened in the past. And that's, that's really what makes it great. It really is. Yeah, yeah that is. And... Um, I believe the woman's name, and I forget, Hattie was the first black person to win, a, win an Oscar. I don't know. Yeah, Hattie McDaniel. Hattie, yep. Hattie McDaniel. I would have told you it was Sidney Poitier, so I don't know where. It's like, she's still not getting credit to this day, because if you would have asked nine times, nine, ten people that question, most people would probably say Sidney Poitier was the first black person to win to win an Oscar. Right. Um, so. when, yeah, when, Mo, when Monique won her Oscar uh, for Precious, she did a replica of Hattie McDaniel's dress 
uh, and wore it to uh, the Oscars. And Henry mm. McDaniel is is surround Henry McDaniel is, is surrounded with some very unique controversy. Um, she knows exactly who she is, mm-hmm. and they're trying to knock her off her pedestal of who she's not, and she's not going for it. Uh, but we have to celebrate her because there are bold steps that are made in her life that I don't think a lot of people would have made. And 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 for that, that's why I say Hattie McDaniel just makes some really, really bold steps. I also think about, yes. you know, with John Singleton, you're bold enough to film this movie, not necessarily with the right backing from Hollywood to tell this type of story. And it turns, up, turns into a blockbuster movie. You know, Boys in the Hood is still uh, a staple of just great America cinema. And, you know, that came from a black man. <laughs> well, you know, it's funny you bring that up. It's one of my favorite lines uh, in movies comes from that movie. And I believe it's uh, Ice Cube. And he says, either they don't know, it don't show, or they just don't care what's happening in the hood. And I, I, re- I recite that. <laughs> one of my favorites. Yeah, well, I don't know, it's, John. It's, it's, <laughs> That's, I'll, I'll take it, John. I will definitely take it. <laughs> I, I will take it, John. Well played. I will definitely take it. I'll definitely take it. So appreciate this. You are tremendous. I feel like we should just sit here for the rest of the day because I know you have more. I know you have more <laughs> in the clip. You, no, I, I do, but I'm trying to save things. Of course, I am um, highly intrigued and really excited about joining you all again for this 2024 campaign. Uh, there are so many things that uh, just in research uh, want to share out. And of course, I'm not trying to tip my hand, but there's a lot of things that I'm working on that I'm very proud of. And this is what, year three year of this? Three. Yeah, year three of this. And I cannot express once again my gratitude to, of course, to um, our Silver Star, Carla, and of course, you all just in general for uh, inviting me to uh, take part of this. It's been absolutely a joy to um, share with such wonderful people and um, such engaging people. I, 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 I say, oh, I see someone put their the documentary up there. But also to say that um, I don't say this enough to audiences and it's because sometimes it doesn't happen, but I want to thank rap for its bravery to talk about these uncomfortable things. Um, Post this Obama America, many people think that there are certain elements uh, inside the soundtrack of America have disappeared because we've, we have a black president or we had a black president, right? And I really love the fact that rap is able to continuously push that envelope and get to the heart of matters and challenge people that are marketing towards Americana to say, tell full and more and richer stories about who we are as an experience. So. For that, I thank all the people at RAP for that and just really appreciate you all. Appreciate you so much, Dr. C. And thank you as always to our queen, Carla. <laughs> thank you, John. We really appreciate you. All right, y'all. Sending you back into the day with love and light. Thank you, Dr. C. We will see you thank in you. a couple of months. Sounds good. See you all then. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs>